Hey everyone, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. I hope everyone is doing well and had a happy Easter or Passover or whatever you celebrate. Happy holidays to you. This is a video that I have been actually working on and researching for a while now. Now we all know that people go missing all the time. I've covered hiking, missing people. I've covered hunters that have disappeared. However, I also wanted to talk about these three cases of fishermen that disappeared. When it comes to fishing, ice fishing tends to be the most dangerous for many reasons because you're walking out on ice. People that aren't experienced often will not know if the ice is strong enough or they just don't know what they're doing. However, it also can be a very fun activity for those people that do know what they're doing and have the proper equipment, those such things. In today's video, none of these cases involved ice fishermen. All these fishermen were just random people that went out fishing and never returned. Not only did they not return, however, after they went missing and searches began, each one of these cases, the fishermen were later found deceased in a very bizarre or terrible way, which I'm going to discuss individually. The first case takes us all the way back to 1896. Yes, you heard me correct. This case actually took place in a town called Clifton, Oregon, which is right on the border of the state of Washington, which actually Clifton is now for the most part a ghost town. When it was originally founded, it was a very thriving fishing community, but unfortunately throughout the years things happen. Now of course I'm going to have maps up as always. This first map just gives you an idea of where in the United States it is. So as you can see, it's right at the top part of Oregon on the border of the state of Washington. On August 31st, 1896, a man by the name of John Sevenson, who was a fisherman, he was found deceased at Clifton in the morning with a bullet wound in his chest. First, the police thought that he possibly committed suicide. However, after further investigation and due to various clues that they found at the scene, they quickly ruled that out. There was no weapon nearby and there was various footprints. Now, these are various pictures from the actual area. These are actually pictures of the police detectives, police force that were working during that time. It took me a while to find pictures because obviously this is from over a hundred years ago. The police at the time did a thorough investigation. They in investigated all these different people in and around the Columbia River area, which is on the area of Clifton, Oregon. They talked to many different fishermen, asked for their whereabouts, anything that they could help with the investigation because at the time there was a fisherman strike going on. John had the position of being keeper of the scow, which is the person that sort of is left behind on the boat after the rest of the crew leaves, watches over the boat and maintains it in any way, and just waits for the rest of the crew to return for their next trip. This was one of the starting places of the investigation. They investigated everybody from the boat. The only thing that they could come up with was that they thought that John Sevenson maybe knew something about other murders that had occurred under similar circumstances. Once John was found deceased, the county issued a big reward for the time. They thought that he was going to go forward with whatever information he had regarding this fisherman's strike and other crimes that had taken place. Now again, these are just pictures of what Clifton looks like. Like I said, it's a ghost town. Remember too, back then they didn't have DNA, they didn't have forensics. The first use of fingerprinting was actually in 1892. This was 1896, so it was still a relatively new thing and many police departments still didn't use it or didn't even know about it. Unfortunately for Mr. Sevenson, they never did find out who was responsible for his death. They never found out a motive. They had ideas, of course, but unfortunately the crime went unsolved and his family never got any answers. Articles that I found, of course, were from 1896, so they were very old. It was very hard to find more information. I don't know anything further of this case other than the fact that I know that it went unsolved and they never did find the perpetrator. 
in 99% of cases involving fishermen, it's usually a drowning accident, a boating accident, something of that such, natural causes. I did a ton of research on these cases. I wanted to start with this one because as you'll see, this one actually is the least bizarre of all of them, even though it is a crazy situation. I mean, who would want to kill a random innocent fisherman just sitting on a dock fishing? It's actually not as uncommon as you may think for fishermen to go missing as well just like hikers not as often but often fishermen will want to get to a very secluded spot they don't want to be around anybody else often they're competing with wild animals like bears depending on the area or where they are fishing our next case takes us to southern california in august of 1902 First, I'm going to show you some various maps because the area has changed a lot, obviously, since then. It was actually took place in an area called Wilmington, which is outlined here. As you can see, it's really built up. This is a big part of Los Angeles now. This is just a map of Los Angeles to show you where in Los Angeles it actually is. So it's sort of in the southern part near Long Beach, what is now Long Beach. On August 18, 1902, the remains of a fisherman was found by other fishermen about two miles northeast of Wilmington near what was then called Watson's Lake. I looked on maps. I couldn't find it. Looks like there's a Trader Joe's there now. Upon discovering the remains, they noticed that there was a rope that had been tied to the right foot, which was also fastened to some kind of a weight that looked sort of like a cinder block in appearance. Obviously, they knew this was no accident. Unfortunately, at the time, the remains were so decomposed that it was impossible to make an identification. They started an investigation right away. These are various pictures from in and around the time that this took place. A man by the name of C.R. Curtis of Los Angeles and F. Hubbard of Norwalk were the other fishermen that made this horrible discovery. So the investigation, of course, started with them. After they were cleared, they moved on to other possibilities. Unfortunately, though, they still had no identification of the remains. It was a very difficult task that they had ahead of them. Now, this is just a picture of modern day, what the area looks like, where all this took place. At the time, the remains were taken to the Lucas Medical Center, and the coroner was working for hours. Unfortunately, he came up with nothing after two days. However, he did reveal that he believed the man to be around 45 years of age. He believed him to be about five foot seven inches tall and roughly 160 pounds now these are actual pictures of the police department at the time i know they're sort of rough looking but remember this is 1902 i tried to make this as real as possible now they only had this is one of the police and fire wagons that they had remember they didn't have cars or vehicles at that point they were starting to come about but at this point they weren't this story actually spread like wildfire through los angeles this was in the papers for several weeks in the los angeles times they were interviewing people all over fishermen this is echo park at the time people fishing off of a little bridge that was there i have to say despite detectives and authorities not having the technology that we have these days they really did amazing jobs back then with what they had i mean some of the cases that i've investigated are just unbelievable that they solved now unfortunately in this case the only clue they had to go on was the fact that a swiss milkman had disappeared from in and around that area about two months prior to them finding the remains of this man this milkman apparently left behind all his belongings. His family reported this to the authorities around a couple days after he went missing. This milkman's physical description, his height, weight, and age matched the description of the deceased person. Unfortunately, the coroner reported that because the deceased had been deceased for over a month and in the water, it was just impossible to make an identification. Despite the efforts of the medical examiner and the authorities, they were just never able to determine what happened. They didn't know whether they had two missing persons or it was just the one missing man, the milkman that disappeared and then was subsequently a victim of a homicide. They just didn't know, but they couldn't figure out who or what the motive would have possibly been. Unfortunately, back then there just wasn't enough technology and the case went unsolved. 
Even the fishermen that originally found him, they said it was the most bizarre, horrible thing they had ever seen. Not only because of the shockingness of finding the remains in the state that they were, but also seeing this long rope with a cinder block attached to it, obviously knowing that someone had done this to this man intentionally unbelievable now here is a double picture to show you how much the area has changed the top picture was 1902 and then the bottom picture is current day it's not only technology but the landscape has obviously changed dramatically not just here in america but globally now, there's tons of places that i haven't been as you can see just in certain places things have grown up things buildings we have now automobiles everywhere as far as this case all i know is that he was given a burial in what they know as a potter's grave in this cemetery the historic wilmington cemetery that's all the information that i could find that's that's where the paper trail and information ended unfortunately I do have a strong sense though that it was the milkman that had disappeared two months prior because they said based on the way he was dressed he wasn't a homeless man or vagrant he was reported missing it's just i don't know it's just one of those enduring mysteries i'll have all the stuff in the description if you want to do further reading but you have to go way back into the archives our next case takes us to Waukesha, Wisconsin in July of 1945. Now, I apologize if I mispronounced that. When a 77-year-old fisherman was found deceased from gunshot wounds. Now, here is various maps of the area of Waukesha. I'm going to have some other maps, too, to show you. It lies to the west of the city of Milwaukee. Now, back in July of 1945, a lot of people would fish this Fox River, which was a very popular fishing spot. It still exists to this day. In fact, this area, what we're going to be talking about, most of the landmarks are still there, just as they were in 1945. On this July 10th of 1945, John G. Platterer, 77-year-old, was found dead from gunshot wounds of the bank of the river as i discussed he was found by men that were playing baseball in the frame baseball field with the arrow there and then where the x is is where they found the remains they saw this from across the river as they were practicing their game they also said when they were interrogated by the police that they saw a young man come out of the bushes from where the trail is and like i said this is all still the same as it was then that x is where they found the remains they saw a man come out of the bushes go through the deceased man's pockets and then run off when the police officers did arrive on the scene they found a 22 caliber rifle near the body however it wasn't in a place where this could have been a suicide. They definitely determined that this was not natural causes and this definitely was foul play. But they had no motive. They couldn't figure out who would want to harm a 77-year-old fisherman just sitting on the bank of the Fox River fishing. They, of course, sent many different officers out. This is actually a picture of what the police cars looked like at that time. This is a picture of the Fox River. It winds through a big part of the state. I'm going to have a picture of the actual police officers. These were the police officers in Waukesha during 1945, during this investigation. At one point in the investigation, they did have some help from the Wisconsin State Highway Patrol. This is one of those police cars at the time, as you can see, much different than what we have now. This is actually a picture of the inside of the police cruisers in 1945 three-speed transmission just to show you that they just didn't have even in 1945 nothing compared to what we have in modern day society so a lot of these type of crimes went unsolved unfortunately this case was a little different though in september of 1945 a man by the name of melvin j fisher who's only 24 of waukesha was arrested and charged with first degree murder in connection with the July 1st shooting of Lewis Platterer, 74 years old. What are the chances this man was arrested and charged with shooting a man that had the exact same last name as this other man? He shot a 74 year old man who was a fisherman. After he did this, he went through the man's pocket and stole his wallet. That's all 
the motive was, was just to steal this man's wallet. The police and other authorities never connected it to the homicide of John G. Platterer that happened in July, the man that we've been discussing in this video. These two crimes happened only months apart. The two men had the exact same last name. They were only three years difference in age. They were both sitting, fishing, and both of them had their wallets stolen. This all could be just a crazy coincidence, but I find it very, very suspicious. Now again, I had access to this information after the fact. The authorities at the time obviously didn't have that kind of information. They weren't even able to see information anywhere nearly as quickly as we can now. And this man, Melvin J. Fisher, was charged and he was found guilty of the crime and homicide of Lewis Platterer, and he was put away for life, I believe. The crime of John G. Platterer and his homicide was never solved. They never charged anyone with it, and it remains unsolved to this day. However, I strongly believe that this man, Melvin J. Fisher, was responsible. Again, I'll have all my sources in the description. If you want to read more about this, you'll have to dive deep into the archives and old newspapers. I want to thank you all for watching. Thank you all for all your wonderful support and help. I really appreciate it. I'll have all my information in the description. If you want to leave me a donation, anything helps. It all goes a long way. Special thank you to co.ag for providing the background music. Hopefully I'll see you all in the next one. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me to the end. I just wanted to say thank you again for everyone being so patient with the upload schedule. For my new subscribers, welcome and thank you for joining. Everybody, I always look forward to your comments, so please leave me any comments with any suggestions. Give me your feedback. If you think that the coin idea that I mentioned in the last video is something you think uh, would be a good idea or if you have any other suggestions like I said I'll have my email address in the description so you can send me submissions for next year's calendar like I said in my last video for anybody that missed it I will be accepting uh, calendar submissions I'm gonna be doing six months of my own pictures and then six months will be pictures that you all have submitted to me and as I said I will credit you on the calendar and any picture that I do use you will receive a free calendar I want to say thank you for all your donations if you do donate and you want to receive a Christmas card please make sure you include your address and thank you so much you all mean so much to me and I love all your support